The docodonts were a group of mammaliiforms, which are close relatives of the earliest true mammals. Originally only known from teeth and jaw fragments they were traditionally thought to be fairly generic shrew-like insectivores, but more recent discoveries of better fossils have revealed they were actually much more diverse Heldanodon had small eyes and short chunky well-muscled limbs with the front paws adapted for digging. Since it inhabited a very swampy environment it probably wasn't a pure mole-like burrower, but it may have instead been a similar sort of semi-aquatic animal to modern platypuses and desmonds. Castor Okada is represented by an exceptionally preserved fossil showing soft tissue and hair impressions. It would have lived in a wetland environment and was well adapted for swimming, with a flattened scaly beaver-like tail, webbed toes and a coat of dense fur very similar to that of modern mammals, made up of both guard hairs and underfur. It was also one of the earliest known mammals with spurs on its ankles. This feature is only seen today in monotremes, but seems to have been an ancestral trait common to all early mammals that was later lost in the lineage leading to marsupials and placentals. Yinotheria is a proposed basal subclass clade of crown mammals which possibly include living monotremes. However, Asphaltomolos wasn't a true monotreme yet. These animals and monotremes are the only group of living mammals that lay eggs, rather than bearing live young, but like all mammals, the female monotremes nurse their young with milk. The key anatomical difference between monotremes and other mammals gives them their name, monotreme means single opening in Greek, referring to the single duct for their urinary, defecatory, and reproductive systems. Steropodon was a monotreme from the Cretaceous period. Monotremes lack nipples, so puggles crawl about more frequently than marsupial joeys in search of milk, this difference raising questions about the supposed developmental restrictions on marsupial forelimbs. Rather than through nipples, monotremes lactate from their mammary glands via openings in their skin. Monotremes have been found in the latest Cretaceous and Paleocene of southern South America, so one hypothesis is that monotremes arose in Australia in the late Jurassic or early Cretaceous, and that some migrated across Antarctica to South America, both of which were still united with Australia at that time. River Slay platypus was a large spoon-billed platypus that was carnivorous and estimated to be twice the size of the modern platypus at one meter long. It is thought to have inhabited fresh water and hunted for a variety of animal prey in the forests that dominated the River Slay site at the time of deposition. The species diet is assumed to have included crustacea like those consumed by the modern platypus, although larger species were available due to its greater size. The ornithorhynchid species were unknown in the later fossil record at the time of discovery, and it defied the assumptions of a single lineage of a platypus-like animal that progressively lost its teeth and became smaller in size. The unique features of the platypus make it an important subject in the study of evolutionary biology, and a recognizable and iconic symbol of Australia. Like other monotremes, it senses prey through electrolocation. It is one of the few species of venomous mammals, as the male platypus has a spur on the hind foot that delivers a venom, capable of causing severe pain to humans. The unusual appearance of this egg-laying, duck-billed, beaver-tailed, otter-footed mammal baffled European naturalists when they first encountered it. In 1799, the first scientists to examine a preserved platypus body judged it a fake, made of several animals sewn together. They also lack stomach, instead, their esophagus connects directly to their intestines. Platypuses have a unique way of regulating their body temperature. They can enter a state of torpor, where their metabolic rate decreases, allowing them to conserve energy and maintain a lower body temperature during extremely cold conditions. Hackett's giant echidna is known only from a few bones. It was about 1 meter long and probably weighed about 30 kilograms this makes it the largest monotreme known to have ever lived. 
Due to the lack of cranial material, its placement into the modern long-beaked echidna genus Zaglossus is uncertain. It had longer, straighter legs than any of the modern echidnas. Some speculate that this feature made the animal more adept at traversing through thickly wooded forests echidnas is covered in fur and spines and has a distinctive snout and a specialized tongue, which it uses to catch its insect prey at a great speed. The short-beaked echidna has extremely strong front limbs and claws, which allow it to burrow quickly with great power. As it needs to be able to survive underground, it has a significant tolerance to high levels of carbon dioxide and low levels of oxygen. It has no weapons or fighting ability but deters predators by curling into a ball and deterring them with its spines. It lacks the ability to sweat and cannot deal with heat well, so it tends to avoid daytime activity in hot weather. During the Australian winter, it goes into deep torpor and hibernation, reducing its metabolism to save energy. It is not threatened with extinction, but human activities, such as hunting, habitat destruction and the introduction of foreign predatory species and parasites, have reduced its abundance in Australia. Frutifosser was one of the earliest known mammals specialized for feeding on colonial insects. It had peg-like enamel-less teeth and a reinforced spine surprisingly similar to those of modern armadillos and anteaters, and powerful digging forelimbs with only four fingers on each hand. It's known from an almost complete skeleton, but its highly modified features make figuring out its exact evolutionary relationships rather difficult. Living during the early Cretaceous of China, Repinomimus was part of a branch of the Eutraconodonts known as Gobicanodontids. These relatively big mammals were specialized carnivores, with strong bone-crushing jaws and their incisor teeth modified into long fong-like shapes. It was roughly the size of a modern wolverine, about one meter long. A second species in the same genus was about two-thirds that size but still among some of the largest known Mesozoic mammals. Since it was larger than some of the dinosaurs it lived alongside, it's likely to have eaten some of them, the species Robustus was actually found with the bones of a juvenile Cetacosaurus in its stomach. Lyoconodon had a long streamlined body and paddle-like limbs. Like other Eutraconodonts it was carnivorous, likely feeding on fish and aquatic invertebrates in its wetland habitat. Its ears show a transitional state between those of earlier mammaliaforms and modern mammals, with the inner ear bones almost fully separated from the jaw aside from a thin rod of cartilage. While this cartilage disappears during embryonic development in modern mammals, in Lyoconodon it was ossified and appears to have helped to support the eardrum. Volaticotherium was the first gliding Mesozoic mammal to be discovered. Measuring about 26 centimeters long, it's known from a mostly complete skeleton with impressions of fur and skin. A gliding membrane extended from its hands to its hind limbs and the base of its tail, its feet had grasping toes, and its tail was flattened to create an airfoil-like shape. It had sharp slicing teeth, indicating a carnivorous or insectivorous diet, unusual since most other known gliding mammals are predominantly herbivores. Megaconus is known from a complete skeleton with some primitive features in its ear bones, vertebrae and heels, giving support to the Haramiodon's armamaliaforms hypothesis. It had teeth similar to rodents, with long incisors and large molars, and was either an omnivore or a herbivore, comparable to modern ground squirrels. The structure of its limbs suggests it would have walked with a gait like armadillos or rock hyraxes. Fur impressions on the fossil show a mix of guard hairs and underfur, but surprisingly the underside of its belly seems to have been only sparsely haired. 
Adalatherium was part of an enigmatic group known as Gondwanatheres, which were probably early members of the Theriaform lineage, slightly closer related to modern marsupials and placentals than to monotremes. Living in northwestern Madagascar during the late Cretaceous, it was one of the larger known Mesozoic mammals. It was probably a marmot-like digging animal, excavating burrows with its large claws and powerful limbs, and since it likely evolved from ancestors that had become isolated on Madagascar over 20 million years earlier it had developed a very unusual mixture of both primitive and highly specialized anatomical features. It had more back vertebrae than any other known Mesozoic mammal, upright forelimbs, sprawling hind legs with bowed out tibias, strong back and leg musculature, and a therian-like pelvis with epipubic bones. Rugosodon is one of the earliest multituberculates represented by near-complete fossil remains. It was a ground-dwelling chipmunk-like animal with highly flexible ankle joints that would have made it very a fast and agile runner, capable of navigating uneven surfaces. These specialized ankles were a defining trait of multis, allowing later forms to adapt to lifestyles ranging from tree climbing to burrowing to gerboa-like hopping. And while many later multis were primarily herbivores, its teeth show it was an omnivore, indicating that a more generalized diet was ancestral to the group. Catops batter was part of a group of Asian multis called the Jadictathoreids, which lived alongside famous dinosaurs like Velociraptor in a sandy desert environment. They were mostly gerboa-like animals capable of bipedal hopping. Although it had features in its vertebrae and hind limbs convergently similar to those of modern hopping mammals, the somewhat more sprawling posture of Multis mean it wouldn't have jumped in quite the same way. It may have actually launched itself upwards at a steeper angle, in a manner a little more like a frog. Barbatodon is mainly known from teeth and partial skull material, so its full size is uncertain, but it was likely rat-sized at around 30 centimeters long. In one specimen its teeth were also preserved with their original coloration, a distinctive blood red. This feature is seen in some modern rodents and shrews, and is caused by iron minerals in the enamel that are thought to add extra strength. Since Multis didn't have ever-growing teeth like rodents, this added durability would have been especially important to them. While they were an incredibly successful group in Cretaceous, Kogayanon had become incredibly rare and restricted to just a single place, Hayteg Island. Isolated there, they evolved into a unique family known as the Kogayanids, diverging from their ancestral mostly herbivorous diet to instead become specialized insectivores with distinctly red iron pigmented teeth and huge blade-like lower premolars. Their insectivorous habits allowed them to successfully survive through the end Cretaceous mass extinction 66 million years ago while the Hayteg dinosaurs and pterosaurs perished. Litovoy brain was surprisingly tiny proportional to its size, one of the smallest known brain-to-body ratios of any mammal, and more similar to those of non-mammalian cynodonts, but it also seems have been highly specialized for processing sensory input with relatively enormous regions associated with smell, eyesight, balance, and motor control. Its reduced brain size may have been due to limited food availability on its isolated island home. Brains are very metabolically expensive organs, and some other extinct island mammals are also known to have evolved smaller brain sizes. Catapsalus was named based on a partial jawbone and a few teeth, and over the next century or so various other similar-looking fossils from both North America and Asia were added into the genus as additional species. Eventually Catapsalus contained eight different species, ranging over about 10 million years from the late Cretaceous to the early Eocene, not especially big compared to some other wastebaskets we've looked at this month, but it was still a problem, muddying up attempts to understand the actual evolutionary relationships and biogeography of the Teneolobidoids. While sharing many plesiomorphic traits with other non-mammaliform cynodonts, Cynoconodon possessed a special, 
secondarily evolved jaw joint between the dentary and the squamosal bones, which in more derived taxa would replace the primitive tetrapod one between the articular and quadrate bones. The presence of a dentary squamosal joint is a trait historically used to define mammals. Symmetrodonts are known throughout most of the Cretaceous period, with one possible late surviving member in the early Cenozoic. They were small mammals with distinctively shaped teeth specialized for carnivorous and insectivorous diets, and their skeletons show an odd mix of therian-like and monotreme-like anatomy, although the more primitive features are thought to be due to either convergent evolution or an evolutionary reversion. At first, they were known only from fossil teeth and jaws, but Zangiotherium was the first to be discovered with a complete skeleton. It had spurs on its ankles that may have been venomous, and a more sprawling posture than Therian mammals, along with limb proportions that suggest it was adapted for climbing. Cronopio was a small dryolestoid mammal from the late Cretaceous of Argentina. Known only from partial skull remains, it's estimated to have been similar in size to a modern. Dryolestoids originated in the mid-Jurassic, and had a primitive tooth structure that suggests they may have been the last common ancestors of marsupials and placental mammals. Cronopio itself is notable for its long saber-like canine teeth. Necrolests had a skull with an unusually upturned snout. It may have been a burrowing mole-like animal, and some reconstructions depict it with a fleshy appendage on its snout similar to a star-nosed mole. Originally thought to be a Thurian mammal, most likely a marsupial, more recent analyses have suggested that it might actually be a member of the Meridialestida, a group of mammals on an evolutionary grade somewhere between monotremes and Therians. It's actually possible that necrolests may still have close living relatives, it's been proposed that the modern marsupial moles might be dryolestids. Mesungulateds had fairly long blunt snouts with strong jaws and teeth adapted for crushing and grinding plants, and may even have been able to chew with a side-to-side -side motion similar to placental ungulates. In fact, they were initially mistaken for early ungulates based on how convergently similar their teeth looked, hence their group's name. Coloniotherium lived in a coastal plain environment and was one of the most common mammals in its ecosystem, suggesting mesungulateds were a particularly successful lineage despite reaching sizes where they would potentially have been directly competing with small herbivorous dinosaurs. Porodon lived during the late Jurassic of Western North America. Although known only from jaws and teeth, the fossil material seems to represent a series of different growth stages, and it was probably a mouse-sized animal growing to about 15 centimeters long. Although some of its close relatives appear to have been tree climbers, its jaws strongly resemble those of modern golden moles, suggesting it was similarly specialized for a diet of earthworms, and may even have had a subterranean mole-like lifestyle. Eomea possessed several features in common with placental mammals that distinguished them from metatherians. However, because it is in a very basal position, it still lacks some features that are seen in later and modern placental mammals. It also has epipubic bones that project forwards from the pubis, features that stiffen the body when in movement. These bones are a benefit to non-placental mammals, but would get in the way of embryonic development in placental mammals, which is why they are not seen in modern forms. Eomea also has an arrangement of teeth types that are more similar to those of earlier mammalia forms. Modern marsupials are part of a larger grouping known as metatherians which split off from their common ancestor with placentals during the Jurassic period, at least 160 million years ago. Probably originating in Asia, they spread to Europe and the Americas during the Cretaceous, 
and diversified into several different groups. Lotharidium belonged to the first group, it had elongated canine teeth, convergently similar to the saber teeth of many later mammal groups. It was probably a highly specialized predator, and may even have been capable of preying on small dinosaurs. Patagonia was the very last known Gondwanathir in the fossil record. Although only teeth and jaw fragments have been found so far, it was probably about 15 centimeters and would have been a burrowing herbivore similar to modern gophers or tukotuko. Its ever-growing rodent-like teeth were adapted for grazing on tough grasses in its savanna-like habitat, and it would have lived alongside several other now extinct types of mammals. Since it seems like these last Gondwanathirs had survived by retreating into a rather specialized ecological niche, they sadly probably didn't persist for very long beyond the time of Patagonia. A wave of extinctions associated with sudden climate cooling about 14 million years ago may well have been the final blow to the once successful lineage of the multituberculates. Pucadelphes was small and likely to have eaten insects. It had a long tail, although incomplete on the best preserved fossils. It is possible that the tail was longer than its body. Seventeen vertebrae were preserved, and it is estimated that there were five to ten additional vertebrae originally. It is regarded as partially arboreal, and partially terrestrial. It may have been social, as more than thirty specimens have been found together. Anatoliadelphes was a specialized carnivore, with strong jaws and bone-crushing teeth similar to the modern Tasmanian devil. It was initially thought to be descended from another type of metatherian found in Europe at the time, but a later study came up with a more surprising result for its evolutionary relationships. It instead may be closer related to the polydilopomorphs, a group known mainly from South America. Quite how its ancestors got as far as Turkey is a bit of a mystery, but it's possible they'd previously dispersed into Africa at a time when the continents were still much closer to each other than they are today, and then spread northwards until they reached the Pontide Island. Juramea was the earliest known Eutherian, it was a shrew-like insectivore with limb anatomy that would have allowed it to climb up trees in a similar manner to modern rats. Something very similar to it would have been the common ancestor of all later eutherians, suggesting that the earliest members of the group may have started out as tree climbers before diversifying into different niches later on. But despite it being closer related to living placentals than to marsupials, placental-style reproduction hadn't actually evolved yet and it would have still given birth to tiny undeveloped young. Cynodelphes grew only 15 centimeters long and possibly weighed about 30 grams its fossilized skeleton is surrounded by impressions of fur and soft tissue, thanks to the exceptional sediment that preserves such details, paleontologists inferred from the foot structure of Cynodelphes that it was a scansorial tree dweller, like the contemporary Eomea and modern possums such as Didelphus. It probably hunted worms and insects. Zalamdalests was part of an early branch of the Eutherian evolutionary tree, a highly specialized group of mammals that it lends its name to, the Zalamdalestids. It had relatively long limbs with especially strong hind legs that show adaptations for rabbit-like hopping. Its long narrow snout may have ended in a flexible proboscis similar to those of modern Senji, and sharp interlocking teeth indicate a carnivorous or insectivorous diet. Its long rodent-like incisors grew continuously throughout its life, suggesting it was gnawing on something tough enough to constantly wear down its front teeth. However, any anatomical similarities to later placentals were probably just the result of convergent evolution. In life, Vera Lambda probably resembled a large ground sloth with a small head and long, well-developed tail and bear-like legs. It was large even for a pantodont, sheer size probably protecting it from contemporary carnivores. It was a heavy-set, five-toed plantigrade animal. 
The vertebrae of the tail were unusually massive, the living animal may have been able to rear up and support itself on the hind legs and tail in order to reach higher leaves for food. Corypidon, a nonplacental pantodont mammal was widespread across the northern hemisphere. Fossil skulls show evidence of sexual dimorphism, with males having larger tusks than females. It also had of the smallest known brain-body ratios of any mammal. One of the largest mammals of its time, it was probably a semi-aquatic animal living in swamps and marshes in a manner similar to modern hippos. The global climate at the time was much warmer than today, with little to no ice at the poles, and its swampy forest habitat extended well into the Arctic Circle. Paleocenopa was similar in size to otter, about one meter long, and had a streamlined body with a well-muscled neck, short powerful forelimbs, slightly longer hind limbs and a very long tail. Inhabiting a subtropical lake ecosystem, it probably swam using both hind limb paddling and otter-like tail undulations. Its strong jaws and teeth suggest it was specialized for crunching hard shellfish prey, but so far preserved gut contents have only shown fish bones and scales. Fairly large claws indicate it was also able to dig out burrows similarly to modern otters and beavers. One group of North American simolestins, the teniodonts, were specialized for digging up tough roots and tubers, with large claws, strong blunt jaws, and big front teeth that became ever-growing in some species. Scowlteria was the earliest known member of this group. Only represented by partial skull material, its full size is unknown, but it was likely around 50 centimeters in length. Still one of the larger Mesozoic mammals around, but not nearly as big as some of the Cenozoic teniodonts would later become. In the early Cenozoic mammals were rapidly diversifying and evolving. And while it was the placental mammals that would end up being the most successful across much of the world, they weren't the first mammal lineage to take advantage of all the ecological niches left vacant in the wake of the end Cretaceous mass extinction. The Simolestins were a group of non-placental eutherians, mammals closer related to modern placentals than to marsupials, that very quickly evolved into a wide range of niches during the Paleocene and Eocene, becoming some of the largest mammals of their time and producing forms as varied as squirrel-like, otter-like, ground sloth-like and hippo-like. Stylinodon took the specializations of its lineage to the extreme, with an odd-looking boxy skull with enormous chisel-like ever-growing front teeth similar to those of a rodent, but derived from its canine teeth rather than its incisors. Its powerful front limbs and large claws were clearly specialized for digging, and for a long time it was thought to be obvious what its diet was, clearly it must have been unearthing roots and tubers from underground. Its tooth surfaces were worn very smooth, indicating that it was eating something particularly tough that was constantly polishing them as it chewed, but what exactly that food source was is still unknown. Gypsonyctops was one of the earliest leptictodons, known only from teeth and jaw fragments, we don't know much about its appearance or full size, although it was probably smaller than its later relatives. Any reconstruction of such fragmentary remains is going to be very speculative, but some restored it as a sort of transitional form, not yet quite as specialized. A more sendu-like animal, mainly quadrupedal but able to run and hop on its hind legs to flee from danger or chase after small fast-moving prey. Leptic tidium are the only known completely bipedal mammals, with macropods and humans. They are especially interesting for their combination of characteristics typical of primitive eutherians with highly specialized adaptations, such as powerful hind legs and a long tail which aided in locomotion. Although they were widespread throughout Europe, they became extinct around 35 million years ago with no descendants, probably because they were adapted to live in forest ecosystems and were unable to adapt to the open plains of the Oligocene. The marks on their fur have been preserved, as well as their stomach contents, which reveal leptic tidium were omnivores which fed on insects, 
lizards, and small mammals.